Okay, so the receptors we're going to be talking about now are not so much a signal transduction receptor, but we're going to be focusing more on the B cell and T cell receptors. Now, unlike the receptor tyrosine kinases and the G protein coupled receptors we talked about in the previous section, in the previous lecture, we're going to be discussing TCR, BCRs, and you'll notice while they have they are not integral proteins and they do have a transmembrane portion. They do not have a cytoplasmic tail that has any type of signaling capability. Instead, what we're going to see here is that there's going to have to be some form of associated receptors or associated side chains. Here, when we look at the T cell receptor, you know, it goes and it crosses, but there's nothing there. There's nothing that allows for it to act as a scaffold to recruit in others, proteins to start, you know, or phosphorylate itself to recruit in and whatnot. So what it has to have are accessory proteins, integral proteins here with the T cell receptor, it is CD3, sigma, delta, and gamma chains. What these are doing is they are also interacting with the T cell receptor and they are bringing to the party what are referred to as ITAMs, immunoreceptor tyrosine based activation motifs, the acronym ITAMs. This is actually the phosphorylated region that would be analogous to what we saw in the last couple of sections of this chapter in the lectures when we are looking at tyrosine kinase receptors. The ITAMs that are supplied by the CD3, here you're seeing, like I said, the delta, the gamma, the epsilon, and down here, the gamma chains. These associate with the T cell receptor. So when the T cell receptor gets bound, these are what are gonna become phosphorylated and gonna start the dominoes falling. Each ITAM has two tyrosine residues. That's what the Y, remember, that um, when it comes to amino acids, um, you know, you can do the name, you can do the three-letter designation, or you can have a one-letter designation. The one-letter designation for tyrosine is a capital Y. So this Y, that Y, these are two tyrosine residues that can become phosphorylated. This is the ITAM. This is one of the accessory receptors, such as the CD3 from the last slide. When everything becomes stable, because the T cell receptor is bound to MHC, there's an epitope, everything becomes stable, the CD3 interaction becomes stable and tight together, and that will allow the ITAMs to become phosphorylated. Phosphorylated ITAMs at these two tyrosine residues will then recruit in another protein. This protein is gonna have some form of the CERC homology domain two, remember CERC two? So they will bind there, and this will be the first kinase that will start the cytoplasmic dominoes. Here, the example they're showing is a protein known as ZAP70. We see the same thing, or a version of it, variant of it, with the B cell receptors, okay? B cell receptors themselves also do not have much of any cytoplasmic tail, so they're going to have to have accessories next to them that are going to start the process of knocking over the dominoes. Set of the CD3, what they have here with their B cell receptors utilized is immunoglobulin alpha, immunoglobulin beta. They're doing roughly the same thing CD3 was on the last slide. Something binds to the B cell receptor, stabilizes everything, while the stable of this will allow the immunoglobulin Ig beta Ig alpha to interact stably. That stability will then allow the ITAMs to phosphorylate. And then next thing you know, you have another, something like ZAP70 come along, binds to the phosphorylated ITAMs, and now it acts as a scaffold, or it's going to act like ZAP70 is going to activate other proteins, start the domino process. <laughs> Well, just because nothing can be quite that simple, we also see that there are going to be other 
layers of accessory proteins, layers of accessory receptors, okay? T cell receptor we just talked about lacks any form of a cytoplasmic tail, so it has to have the CD3, the epsilon, delta, gamma, and I'm forgetting what the other one is right now, but you know what I'm talking about. So here they are. Here's the ITAMs for each of those. But how is it they get phosphorylated? You know, it's not so much they're phosphorylating themselves. No, it's actually phosphorylating them is the protein LIC, LCK. The thing is, LCK is just not free floating around. LCK is associated with the cytoplasmic domain of CD4 or CD8. Remember, wherever you see T cell receptor, you also have CD4, CD8 nearby, which is going to stabilize the MHC T cell receptor interaction. CD4 gets stable, LIC gets activated, phosphorylates ITAMs that are all here now joined together in close proximity to each other, which will then recruit in ZAP70. ZAP70 starts the dominoes falling. Regular LIC phosphorylate to activate, dephosphorylate to inactivate. So it's not a one and done. As we're going to see on the next slide, it goes back and forth between being active and inactive, depending upon phosphorylation state and the phosphorylation state of the scaffold proteins it's bound to that link it to CD4 and CD8. So you see this PI TAM, this is supposed to represent phosphorylated ITAMs, will bring in ZAP70. ZAP70, which will then scaff, you know, which then phosphorylate scaffold protein, which will then brings in, say, like phospholipase C. Phospholipase C, which we talked about over the past two lectures, um, will then go through and cut and cleave, releasing IP3 and so on and so forth. Well, the scaffold proteins we see there are known as LAT and SLIP76. LAT and SLIP76 really do not want to interact with ZAP70 unless they are phosphorylated. Once it's phosphorylated, it interacts, you know, with later or further down the line proteins. So what we're looking at, ignore this one right here, we'll talk about this in a minute. So what we're looking at is CD4 or CD8, depending upon which type of T cells you're talking about. Here's the cytoplasmic tail, and it has this cis zinc motif right here. Attached to it at a terminal end are circumology 3, circumology 2 domains. Turns out the circumology 2 domain, when it's phosphorylated, holds lick in an inactive state. CD4 becoming stable, will open this up and allow for other signal proteins, uh, signal receptor proteins. CD45 for one will then go and remove that phosphorylation, that phosphate group, which allows LIC to become an active kinase. It will then go and it will phosphorylate ITAMs in its immediate vicinity, activating these by phosphorylating at the tyrosine residues and allows these then to go and also start phosphorylating other ITAMs. So from what I've read, it's not a little unclear in the textbook, from what I've read, and I'm not sure if it's true, so don't hold me to this, LIC starts phosphorylating the ITAMs, but once it gets to a certain point, they will start phosphorylate, autophosphorylating other ITAMs in their vicinity. So here it's the gamma, and the gamma will then trigger the epsilon, the delta, and whatnot to also start phosphorylating themselves. Once they become phosphorylated, as you see here, they will recruit in ZAP70. ZAP70, you know, phosphorylates lack SLIP76 because these are scaffold proteins they will then recruit in other proteins and it starts this cycle. You know, phos unphosphorylated interacts with nobody, phosphorylated now brings in, activates more, and it starts another layer and another and another. 
until what you end up with is PLC gamma being active or, uh, activated, which then goes through and cuts and releases IP3. And it just keeps going and going and going. 